Advanced TV History. Come along with us as we connect the dots of TV and women to feminism and history. All that important context that helps us celebrate the women of TV. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Now today, we're talking about Sherry Lewis. You know, the pioneering woman ventriloquist who changed children's television? First appearing on Captain Kangaroo back in 1956, and four years later, was flat out producing The Sherry Lewis Show. Daughters Mallory Lewis and Lamb Chop fill us in on Sherry's career from those days through the 90s. You might remember Lamb Chop's Play Along or the Charlie Horse Music Pizza, which were both shot in Vancouver, and her videos and her books and so much more about Sherry Lewis. Listeners, it's our pleasure to present this very special visit with Mallory Lewis and Lamb Chop. Listeners, I was uh, contacted just a couple months ago by University of Kentucky Press, and lo and behold, they were getting close to publishing Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop, the team that changed children's television. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the book, but I don't want Mallory to share too much because the whole purpose is to go buy the book. And you can pass it down and pass it around, but you can also buy it as gifts. And we're going to talk about how to get the book later in the episode. But first, we just have a whole lot of Sherry Lewis to talk about. And I'm thrilled to be able to talk to Mallory because it was five years ago that Dwight Hurst and I were talking about children's television and Sherry's role, her impact, her legacy. And that was for, you know, two armchair quarterbacks and and huge fans doing it, doing it from that seat. And here we're going to have uh, an insider's look and an insider's perspective. So I am uh, grateful that you're here today, Mallory. I am thrilled to be here today. I love Let's... this podcast and uh, I, I, I think this is going to be such fun. We can put Sherry Lewis in the context of the Fred Rogerses of the world, the the Sesame Street, even Barney. We have a we now have we a don't six... ever put mom in the context of Barney. Well, it, for those of us who are in the consumer end, once once Sherry passed, and that's part of this whole conversation, uh, Barney was not a bad thing. And of course, my kids were too old for Teletubbies by the time those rolled in. So. Uh, we will talk about the quality of children's programming and because that really was uh, near and dear to Sherry's heart. So, so Mallory, there you were, you know, it had been a decade, two decades almost since your mother had passed. And what is it that prompted you to begin writing this book and researching? I, I think it, more to the point, why did I not think of this sooner? Because my co-author, Nat Segaloff, um, he's he's a award-winning biography, biographer. And it was one day over dinner. And this was not the first dinner we'd had since mom passed. One day over dinner, I said, you know, we should really do a book on mom. And he goes, yeah. So I think it was actually our RBG's documentary that mm-hmm. what spurred me. We also have a documentary deal and we're in post-production on the documentary on mom. So I think that uh, we owe this book to RBG. We owe so much to RBG. Mm-hmm. We do, and the and the women who are out there doing documentaries, including Julie Cohen, and and they're doing a Gabrielle Giffords, and then there's a Rosa Parks one. So we are we are fortunate that some of this biography is finally coming to the surface because it's really important and it has been well, so overlooked. You know the saying, uh, "History is told by the victors." Well, unfortunately, um, the the victors have all been men. Uh, when Mom was first working, she was making 10 times what my father was working when they met. He had to sign for her credit card. And, and obviously that's gotten better. But I think as we all know, with the Dobbs decision, we have not moved forward, which is why we can only hope that the midterms get a little better. Mom would have been horrified because she was she was much more like Lucille Ball than she was like Fred Rogers. She was mm-hmm. a woman in the late 50s who had her own production company. There were two of them. They both had red hair, Mom and Lucille Ball. Her struggle, what this book is about, and the reason I wrote this book, or really, I talked this book, Nat wrote this book to give credit where credit is due. The reason I I felt it was important to do it is because people have an opinion about who my mom was. They have a vision about who my mom was. She was a nice little lady who played with puppets. She was also a dancer. She was a conductor. She was an activist. She was a philanthropist. She was a wife. She was a mother. She was a three-dimensional human being. But I think that women 
in particular, get pigeonholed by our society. You cannot survive in this business. You cannot survive in any business without being focused, without being smart, without um, being good at what you do. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about your mother's business acumen in a little bit, because it's really, it's actually quite complicated. Um, it, It not only is that she was a woman in the business world that was spanned numerous decades and licensing and copyright and all of the muck that the lawyers bring to the table, which was mommy, part of her mommy, part of her legacy. Yeah. Go mommy ahead. To say if you are going to have a long career, you're going to have to get used to going out of fashion a lot. There's a joke in our family, the women in our family don't hear the letter N. So when people say no, all we hear is, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I like that. That's a good one. So you mentioned briefly that there's a documentary in post-production. What's that t- entitled? Because we'll be kind of tracking that. Is that is called with- Sherry and Lamb Chop. Lamb Chop thinks it should be Lamb Chop and Sherry, but well, she's like that. Well, uh, so uh, listeners, you're going to be hearing more about Sherry Lewis, I hope, because we deserve to really honor her in the way that Life happened very quickly in the in the mid 90s and there was so much going on and and everybody thought that women were going to continue to make strides. And and I think the more we reflect on Sherry's good work and her legacy, uh, the more we are all inspired to say we've got we've got more in us and we've certainly have more fight in us. When when Dwight and I were working on the podcast five years ago, it was hard to find information about your mother. So yeah, I had all of the tapes. So the documentary there's going to have footage that hasn't been seen in 40 years, 50 years. And since I don't know when that's coming out, the best place to start is with Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop, the team that changed children's television. Okay, now look, if we're going to do this for the school play, we really have to do it fast. Wait, 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 wait. We cannot rehearse now. Why not? Because Lamb Chop has the hiccup. I do. Uh, I do. Oh, how, how do you get rid of the hiccups? Oh, when I get the hiccups, I can never ever get rid of them. Lamb chop. Ah, 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 what were you doing? I was trying to scare the hiccups out of you. You scared the daylights out of me. My hiccups are still fine, thank you. <laughs> Lamb chop. Don't fool around. I'm not going to touch you. Uh, uh, oh, I know what to do. Look the other way. Now, don't listen. Now, uh, Charles, what you have to do is, don't listen. What you have to do is look at her and make a horrible face, and you'll scare the hiccups out of her. Okay, I'll do it. Okay. Well, Chow. I didn't make a horrible face yet. Oh, I couldn't tell. So you have this unique vantage point. You were her daughter. You were a, a collaborator. You worked with her in the la- latter stages, probably the shows that my kids watched. Of all of the awards and recognitions, the Emmys and the Peabody and the Parents' Choice, were there any awards that really struck her as being the most meaningful? Yes, I think in the early days, the Peabody did. The 1960. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but I think she and I have the only mother-daughter Emmy for writing in a children's series, as it turns out. So I know that that one meant a great deal to her, and it certainly meant a great deal to me. She also liked her honorary doctorate from Hofstra University, because what Jewish girl doesn't want to be a doctor? <laughs> but but I think the act, the, the thing that she did that probably meant the most, um, other than having me, um, is when she testified in front of the House subcommittee on behalf of children and on behalf of children's television. I think that was a great moment for her. You were given three minutes to testify. And at the end of her three minutes, Lanchop popped up and asked if she could have her own three minutes. And Ed Markey said, of course, Slam Chop. So I know that meant a lot to mom. Washington was a different place 30 years ago when she was doing this. And uh, and broadcasting and the, and the whole world of children's television was very different. But I mean, it would be cool to do Sherry's testimony, you know, we grab the audio. And I, I kind of dug around to see if I could find the audio. But I, I did pull down the transcript that that is available through the government website. Um, just Google Sherry Lewis Congressional Testimony. 
And so here are some of the excerpts. Understanding that in 1960s, she won a Peabody Award. Sherry won a Peabody Award for being, at that time, the children's television of the baby boom, the core of the baby boom. And now in 1993, when she's testifying March on Capitol Hill, it's it's really to try to save children's programming from going well, crazy. What had, what had happened was, of course, mom sold merchandise because the kids liked the television show. But the toy companies started creating television shows to sell toys, which is mm-hmm. different. Mom yeah. used to say that we have to do better by our children because they are our only known source of adults. Mom never talked down to kids. The storylines were about real life situations. They were little morality plays. She felt that you show it, you do it, and then you can teach it. The main difference between her and Mr. Rogers, other than breasts, was that mom never said to kids, you're fine the way you are. Now, she didn't mean you're not fine because you have the color skin or a color hair or a body image. What she meant was, you can do it. You can be better. I encourage you to try hard. I encourage you to learn. She did um, 101 things for kids to do. 101, these are books, 101 magic tricks, 101 ways for kids to really make money. And none of them involved having a YouTube channel playing video games. (laughs) But, But had that existed, she would have included that. But mom really wanted kids to stretch themselves, to believe in themselves. And not just because somebody said, you're perfect the way you are. You don't believe in yourself if someone tells you you can do something. You believe in yourself when you have done something. Mom's dad was Peter Pan, the magic man, the official magician for the city of New York. And my grandpa would wake up every day and say, better and better every day. You know, he was the most confident. He believed in in the power of of self you know, actualization. I mean, he was, he was way ahead of his time and he believed in my mom. And so I think that's why she had that energy and that focus. Mm -hmm. So some of her testimony, and it's, it's really, it's actually very relevant that she's saying some of the things that she said almost 30 years ago. And uh, so to the, to the house committee, she said, you know, and this is just part of it. On an escalator in Atlanta, this lady comes up to me and says, I want to thank you at PBS for helping to keep our kids kids for just a little while longer. PBS is working with great energy, devoting one third of their programming time to producing shows that are thoroughly innocent, totally wholesome, and at the same time, stimulating and vigorous. Since the Children's Television Act was passed, some broadcasters have claimed that everything educates. What has been mentioned when broadcasters claim that G.I. Joe is enriching They do not do so with a straight face. However, for decades, they have been pulling the wool over nobody's eyes and getting away with it. And then she goes on to say, I am hoping for more diversity. I am not for banning anything. Well, in terms of diversity, just to to talk about it in, in context that we use that term now, Lamb Chops Play Along, from the very beginning, before it was cool to have a diverse cast, had a diverse cast. We were the first kids show that had on Charlie Earth's Music Pizza, a character who was uh, disabled. Yet not a puppet character, but an actual one of the kids was in a mm-hmm. wheelchair. We, being a Jew in the 50s, much similar, unfortunately, to what's going on now, being a Jew in the 50s meant that you were other. And mom was very sensitive to other. And she didn't care what, All you had to do was be excellent. You could be purple and excellent and it would be fine with her. You Mm -hmm. could be, you know, seven feet tall, two feet tall, fat, skinny, pimpled face, whatever. Nothing mattered as long as you were excellent. How did she interact with those kids and how did they interact with her? I mean, what we did was we didn't deal with it Mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter if you're in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. That's not it doesn't matter if you're gay. Like mm-hmm. that's the least, those are the least interesting things about a person. So we, the only in one episode, um, we had a parade going on and the, and this is a lot of years ago. So I'm blanking on names and there was a parade going on and this little girl wanted to be in the parade, but was bummed because she couldn't be in a marching band. Well, so the point was, of course, you can be in a marching band your way. So we had someone pushing her and she, I don't remember whether she played the symbols or what it was. But that was the only time that we 
dealt with the fact that she was disabled because it was unimportant. And it 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 is unimportant. And we were a little terrified because puppet sets are raised. They're, it's much more comfortable to be a puppeteer standing and going like this with your hand than it is to be laying on the floor trying to fit underneath something. So we had these big pits, puppet pits, where the puppeteers, you got a little kid in a wheelchair, six feet off the floor, you can't have railings. So there, there was a little bit of some scary that, you know, we were like, eh, but, um, but nothing bad happened. <laughs> so it's okay, because being a Jewish mother, my mother was very careful. And that was 30 years ago. One other yeah. question, I guess, is all of these young people who were in these this later version of Sherry and Lamb Chop right. and Charlie Horse, are you still in touch with them? Do I am they... in touch with some of them. Um, one, Andrew Francis is, he was the most lovely little boy. First season, Charlie Horse music, uh, Lamb Chops play along. We, I was casting and he was there with his three-year-old brother. He was six. And this kid was like, boom. Like you knew the minute he walked in the room, up, oh, you got the job. Um, mm-hmm. Little brother was very shy and he was so kind. He spent the entire um, audition turning his little brother toward us, trying to support his little brother. Still make it still like just the kindness. Um, and Chance Perry, who played uh takeout of uh, the big orangutan on Charlie Rose Music Pizza, we're mm-hmm. still in touch. So a couple of them I'll tag in and out, but the whole crew and I are still very good friends. So that, that those workforce, those you know, workplace relationships are so important. And and that was part of the secret sauce. When mom passed, Sean Williamson, who was our producing, my producing partner on Charlie Horse, they had to shut the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Company, down for a Friday because 60 people who had been on our crew said, we're going to the memorial. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was just, I love love my Canadians. A lot of good work. It takes place in Vancouver and Toronto. Okay, moving on to more of what Sherry testified about. She's kind of sticking it to these guys. And she says, by the way, I don't entirely agree with what you said about it being a clear demarcation between education and entertainment. Children learn best through play. And I believe you have to find a way always to make it entertaining for the children, thoroughly entertaining, or they will use the dial. I do believe that has to be the focus. But the commitment to accept the challenge, the very real challenge, should be at the heart of the industry and the basis for broadcast renewal. If all broadcasters were regulated so they had to provide good stuff equally, perhaps there would be a race for quality, just as there is now a race for market share. Yes. Well, mom mom was one of the early coiners of the term edutainment. But my grandfather used magic to teach uh, boys math at the Yeshiva University. So it has the the force is strong in our family on, on this particular subject. It was such an important time. You know, 1993 cable was definitely happening, but but we hadn't gotten to streaming. And then and the the all of the mergers that happened that then became the owners of the rights of what had been and were in charge of creating the content for the future just yeah. changed the game entirely. You know, I'm thinking, too, about the fact that your mother really was a woman in a man's game. And you talk about that in and out. You write about that in the book. How did she do things differently? Were you able to sort of glean how she managed her career different from those of her colleagues or other other men you knew of in the business? Um, Mom ran the office and the production company out of the house. So our downstairs family room was the production meeting room, also the rehearsal studio. My dad's office in the back became the edit suite. Um, The writer's room worked out of the garage. And mom's, you know, she's the CEO in charge of everything. Her bedroom was her office and she would sit on her bed and with the papers, you know, file folders spread out on this queen size bed. And then in the other bedroom, there was a staff of four because she kept four people busy at all times. She had a little tape recorder and she would dictate, Richard, as soon as you hear my voice, finally, poor Richard went slamming into her bedroom one day and said, Sherry, I cannot do everything as soon as you like hear your voice. You have got to stop doing that. And Georgia, our housekeeper, was craft services. So I don't think many men ran their business out of their home. But that way she, again, it was all about what she had to balance. She had to balance being a wife. She had to, she had dinner on the table at six o'clock every day. Did she cook it? No. 
Did she sit down with Georgia at the beginning of every week and go over the menu for the week? Yes. My dad always had clean clothes and a spotless house. Did she clean or spot? No. But she worked with Teresa to make sure that Teresa sure. knew what priorities were. Well, that's what it's like to be a CEO slash wife. I was always driven to all of my appointments. And Did she drive me? No. I had a nanny who drove me. But has anyone in my life ever said to me, oh, was it hard having a working father? Nobody's ever said that. Now, why in most interviews, I get asked, was it hard having your mom work? Why would that be hard? I had my, my, I got more attention from my working mother than I did from my working father. I think running it out of the house actually made it easier for mom to balance that. And, you know, being a woman, my dad would get up in the morning, take a shower, go to the work, come home. Maybe he'd shave. Now, that's not how it works if you're an entertaining female. You get up in the morning, you got to figure out, do I, is it, it, it when's my Botox appointment? I got to get my hair done. I got to get my lashes. You know, there is a lot more to being a woman than there is to being a man in yes. terms of the daily preparation. Mom would memor, would lay on her back while Nancy put on her individual eyelashes ahead of the game while listening to songs that she had to memorize. Mm. She didn't drive on purpose. A lot of wasted time driving places. Right. And and the experience you had being able to see all that because that's where you lived was yeah. an understanding of delegation and yes. relationships, professional relationships. And so would you say then that in uh, with the 2022 lens, she really was a feminist, whether she believed it or not? Well, she knew she was a feminist. She just didn't. She brooked no nonsense from anyone. Um, one day, one of the directors who mom was not fond of, we were sitting looking at the schematics on the um, on the studio floor. And he goes, where's the power here? Where's the power? Now he meant the electrical plug. Where's the power? And mom goes, right here, buddy, right here. And and it was before, I think to some degree, it was the the snapback of the progress that had been made by so many women in it. Oh, yeah. Things Hadn't were looking, really up. Felt Things were looking yeah. up then. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit then about when your mother passed away and what happened, what was what was going on in the last year, year and a half of her life with regard to the the business and what she ended up doing and how that impacted the fact that you just didn't watch Sherry and reruns, even though she had passed away, which was kind of something I was hoping. Yeah, it never made sense to me. Um, <laughs> my father. My mom spent a lot of time trying to make my father uh, feel good about himself also, because, you know, if you're a very powerful woman, you kind of got to prop up the prop up the guys. And so he he was in charge of overseeing some of the more male parts, the business parts, neglected to get the either the trademark or the copyright on Lamb Chop Renewed. That cost the family, I don't know, 10, 20 million dollars. And he wanted her to retire. And she didn't want to. So in order to get the funding for Charlie Horse Music Pizza, she had to essentially sell the rights to the puppets. Now, that was fine because she retained the rights for as long as she was alive. Unfortunately, that was only about 16 months. That's why Lamb Chop's not back on the air. I have been touring, performing live with Lamb Chop for a very long time. Hello there. It's a lovely to see you. Now we haven't done a television show because the rights were kind of murky. But they're not as murky anymore. Hello, I see you got your doll too. Two grown red-haired women playing with Lamp Chop. This is my interview. Go sit down. Hi. Um, so, so yeah, you know, it, it, it was unfortunate. You, they say depression is living in the past. Anxiety is living in the future. Um, and contentment is living in the present. So there you have it. That's what I say to myself at three o'clock in the morning when I'm anxious. And and certainly it was uh, there were all sorts of people involved in trying to do the right thing. And it and it didn't work out the the sale of Sherry Lewis Enterprises to Golden Books. Then, I mean, is it is there any way you can get to? I can't say any more because okay. things are in got it. OK, so it, it's but there's hope. Hope springs eternal. It's it's complicated, certainly. I mean, it's well, the reason why we can't watch Murphy Brown, because yeah. it's complicated. Contracts I'm very lucky because I have a very, very, very good lawyer who 
uh, was on my mom's show when he was a little boy um, and in, back in the 50s or 60s. So I get the family discount, which is it's so kind because he's really aces and, and I certainly couldn't afford him. Well, I mean, he is he is going after, you know, the, oh, Steve. The- we love you, Steve. He's going after the something that is incredibly meaningful and valuable. And, and oh, if, you know, if a contract can get written, it can get rewritten and it can get bought out. And I wish you guys all the best in whatever you're trying to pursue, because the world needs more of what your mother created and even what you're creating now. Let's talk for a little bit about when you decided to pick up Lamb Chop and bring her back and, well, and take uh- her out. I spent the first year after mom passed, I was pregnant, and I spent the first year accepting posthumous awards for mom. Finally, my ex-husband quite intelligently said, you know, we can't actually make a living with you accepting posthumous awards. Do you want to do this? And so I went to an event that Pat Prof and his wife Karen had sponsored, charity event, and mom had gotten the award the year before, and they wanted to honor her posthumously this year. So I went and I didn't know if I was going to do it or not. I tucked Lamb Chop in the podium. And when they called her name, I came, went up, stuck my hand in her, pulled her up. And she said, Sherry would be so proud. Now, if it had been a script, it would have said, Lamb Chop, quote, Sherry would be so proud. Beat, gasp, wild applause. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I thought, oh, I can do that. Now, mind you, I was just still accepting awards. And some guy called me from, I don't remember the name of the theater and said, I've been following your career. I'd love you to come and do a Christmas show. I'm thinking, what career is he talking about? I said, well, give me till Monday, because this was um, maybe May. And I knew I could do Lamb Chop. I didn't have an act, Mm -hmm. but I thought I could do this. Um, And so I said, yes. And then I did two minute shows and then three minute shows and then six minute shows. Luckily, the L.A. Zoo was very fine, kind and gave me opportunities for those. And I started performing at the Magic Castle uh, in Los Angeles. And all of the old magicians would come over after the show and oh. they'd say, Carlin, you did really well. But when you look at the audience, take a beat or, you know, at the end of your act, you know, move your hands up. That'll get them on their feet. I mean, like I got real stagecraft from these yeah. guys. Yeah. Um, and. Then I started touring and doing fairs, and now I do only performing art centers, um, and I do a legacy show, and it's really fun because about half the show is me and Lamb Chop and Hush Puppy singing and performing, and the other half is me curating stories about mom, and Mm -hmm. I always say to the audience at the beginning, I know you wish you could have bought a ticket to Shari Lewis and Lamb Chop. I do too, but Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that, and you're going to have a great time, I promise you. And whichever Sherry you remember, whether it's the ponytails, the curls, the shag, the bob, the ponytail with the curls, whichever is your Sherry, you're going to see her on this show. You can see Mallory and Lamb Chop at the State Fair, but they stopped by here for a visit on the Yellow Couch. It's Wait. been a while. You, it's it's like been five years. What's interesting is I wanted to say, oh, you've grown up, but you're eternally, what, six years old? You're so little. You're so dumb, you wish you knew how to stay six for <laughs> Yeah. I, I wish that I could. <laughs> Even though it's been like five years since we've seen you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, don't you ever just want Lamb Shot to grow up? Um, no, because then I'd have to grow up. <laughs> right? And Don't am, do it. I am really immature. So. <laughs> You're good with I'm it. I'm good with it. We, yeah, no, it's funny because she is eternally sick, but our relationship is different than mom's and her relationship mm-hmm. because mom was, well, Charlie was my mom and now he is my sister and I'm not so impressed with my sister. <laughs> right. My audiences are 80% adults. So... Mm-hmm. No, it's like six members of the family and little Susie. I say I have the best job in the world. I fly someplace. They put me up at a decent hotel, get to go to a performing arts center where highly talented tech guys make me sound and look better than I actually do. I get to sing. I get to dance. People clap for me. Afterwards, a thousand people wait in line to hug me and hug Lamp Shop, tell me how proud my mother would be of me. And then someone hands me a check. Now, mind you, I haven't done this in two years because 
some people wouldn't wear masks. Um, yeah. But I have my first gig coming back at the um, in Hardwick, Massachusetts, December 3rd. And I'm so excited. I, I miss the happy sound. I actually just started rehearsing for it this morning. I still remember the act, mostly. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And so uh, in your act is Lamb Chop, a 2022 Lamb Chop, where yes, she... she is. Well, she is always six. She is yes. always Lamb Chop. But um, she's running for president. And she's got some pretty funny things to say about that. Uh, she's an influencer. And she actually is. She was number... We hit number seven on Twitter. I had nothing to do with it. But I woke up one morning and all my friends are texting me. You got to see what's going. What you got to see what's happening with Lamb Chop on Twitter. And I thought, what did I? What did I tweet last night that I'm not <laughs> remembering? But some random guy named Kurt Fry had tweeted something about Lamb Chop, and it hit number seven. And my TikTok, I'm loving doing TikTok at your fave Lamb Chop at your fav Lamb Chop. We're like one of my last uh, TikToks hit over three hundred thousand. So Lamb Chop's very much enjoying being an influencer. So it's a combination of, you know, one of the reasons Lamb Chop has endured is she's such a great character. And so I always stay within the character. She is obviously a different six-year-old now than she would be a six-year-old 60 years ago. Uh, Mom always pushed the edge with Lamb Chop also. I mean, she had this great drunk routine, which I do not do at this particular (laughs) show. But um, I once was performing it at a nightclub and someone comes up to me and goes, your mother would be horrified about that routine. I go, madam, my mother wrote that routine. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Man shop. Oh, you look at me here. Hello, shop. Hello, Hello. Wowee! Have you got alcohol on your breath? That's right. Have you been drinking? No, I just gave my tongue a rub down. <laughs> Young lady, have you had an alcoholic beverage? Is it a martini? Alcoholic beverage. People say to me, oh, Lamb Chop, you know, sure is, is more current than she was with your mom. And I say, well, first of all, Let's cut mom some slack. She's been dead 24 years. I go, and also I wrote for Lamb Chop then and I write for her now. So if mom's hand had still been doing the work, she'd be this current. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we are. We were big fans of uh, Lamb Chop in the Haunted Studio. Ah, thank we you. We had it on VHS. And then I had at one point a VHS to DVD converter. <laughs> and so we still have it. I have a six-month-old grandson who will probably need to start watching it in about a year or so. It sounds like Lamb Chop is loving the 21st century in her own way with her with her sister um, by her side. And I I think you know you probably are approaching this business with the some of the limitations that certainly came about when your mother's life ended and her career ended. And you, but you grew up in the shadow of a businesswoman. And so what do you think were her secrets to success? You know, you said working person on the planet, the documentary director, Lisa Dopolito, who did the Love Gilda documentary. Mm -hmm. She said the hardest thing about doing this documentary was getting anyone to say any sentence other than, oh my God, Sherry was so hardworking. Sherry was so focused. I mean, there's no scandal. Like Lisa's like, I'll protect your mom's image, but you know, is there anything I need to look out for? I'm like, no, (laughs) she just didn't do bad things. She didn't drink. She didn't, I mean, she'd have an occasional glass of wine, but she wasn't a drinker. She didn't do drugs. She didn't, she worked out all the time. I mean, she just was very focused. She did not take her eye off the ball. So if she was going to do a Ted talk, it would be all about focus. All about what you think. All about focus, all about. My grandpa used to say the day begins the night before. And that means if you have like, for instance, I had a very busy day today. This you're number three out of four Zooms on a variety of subjects and projects. And I had a lot of uh, housekeeping stuff I had to do. I went to bed at eight o'clock last night because I knew that if I was going to get my workout in, I was going to have to be up at five. 
No. Am I an eighth as disciplined as my mother? No. Mom was, so the day begins the night before, prepare for your next day, lay out your clothes. What kind of wisdom would she impart about working, you know, being a leader of a team and because she led this business? She, she did lead the team. She, I have a very different leadership style than my mom. We both lead from the front though. Mom and I always, we were the first person on the set. She was less interpersonal, except with a very small group of people. Mom did a perfect show that you were invited to watch. I do a slightly less perfect show, but you're a part of it. You talked a little bit early on about how she felt that part of the success of her longevity was the fact that she knew she would have to change. Talk a little bit more about that, either in terms of what you remember and not just the change of her hair, which certainly right. happened over time. <laughs> she, you know, um, she was uh, one of the most famous people on television in the 50s, early 60s. And then it ended because cartoons came on. So then she said, OK, they don't want me to do that. I'm going to be I'm going to write books. I'm going to conduct orchestras. I'm going to tour. I'm going to be in Vegas. I'm going to. And that went on. And she always kept trying to get back on TV. Um, but every time a door closed, she kicked down a wall. And finally, she was able to take down the wall of no, Sherry, you can't have a TV show. That's amazing. And it's inspiring. Um, I mean, that that should be what everybody thinks about, particularly women, when they are told no or yeah. they they try. Maybe that just isn't the right approach. You know, maybe she was never really intended to conduct orchestras for the rest of her life or. She was very happy to go back to she, mom. All she ever wanted was her own TV show. I'm so happy that she only had six weeks from her last moments performing to her passing. Mm -hmm. If she had had her way, she would have stepped off the stage and died. And if I could have given her that gift, I would have, because that's the, her whole life was about being Sherry Lewis. Mm, that is, uh, mm, I, I, I remember, I remember those six weeks. I remember. Yeah. And uh, so listeners from the perspective of how I remember it was because our daughter was uh, well, three, three-ish, four-ish, and was just a huge Lamb Chop fan. And, and already at the, at the dining room table, my kids knew at, at three and five, give or take, that I had written a letter to General Mills complaining about the fact that all of the cereal mascots were men. Or there was like the bumblebee on uh, Honey Nut Cheerios, you maybe could say didn't have a gender. gender but, but yeah, gender neutral. But otherwise, all the mascots were men. And and I got this, you know, sort of very non committal. Yeah, I just got a letter back and I was so mad and I explained it to them at the at the dining room table. And uh, and so then the news happened about Sherry and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to tell Allison at some point. And fortunately, in the life of a four year old, there's enough there's enough busy stuff going on right. that we were able to just say she's not on TV anymore, but we scooped up as many VHSs as we could. And we watched them, <laughs> watched them and sang the songs. And you realize my mind is now thinking, what kind of cereal would mom be? <laughs> it wouldn't have sugar in it, though. It would be healthy. Right, right. Um, it's uh, well, and kids are eating different things for breakfast these days. Mom would be right. a bento box and she would have a QR code that you could scan where the kids could watch a video to how to fill their own Brento box, you know, mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. your breakfast. You know? Right. And then, <laughs> and then something to watch while they're eating too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Does Lamb Chop have her own phone, by the way? No, she does. She's only six. I'm, I'm, a, I'm afraid of, of what she would encounter on the internet. The, you know, does mom, she play with your iPad? No, she's she is pretty much um, I mean, like she loves it when I make TikToks with her, uh -huh. but she hasn't asked for her own phone. She doesn't she doesn't have she shares my email. So, you know, I'll read her some of the emails. Wow. Um, so the is the book published by the University of Kentucky Press. Is it officially out and available? Oh, yeah, you can get it on Amazon. Sherry okay. Lewis Lamb Chop, the team that changed children's television. My favorite part of the book is. My mom didn't really cook, but she loved lamb. I like to eat lamb and she mm -hmm. loved, she had a few recipes she did, 
And at the back of the book are all of mom's lamb recipes from her little, you know, three by five card, card catalog of recipes. Mm -hmm. When, uh, when, when I think about this, when I was reading this book and it's, you know, it's published for media studies students or for people who are, you know, just trying to understand the entertainment business as well as a a memoir or a biography of a a woman, women's studies. But it, it strikes me that also, as you say, your audiences are overwhelmingly adult and yes. that maybe there are, uh, if if listeners, you are looking for that gift for your grandma or the aunt. Or for your millennial, because mom was on TV. If you were 28 or older, you watched mom. 28 mm-hmm. to dead. Mm-hmm. Maybe 30 to dead. You have a, a good memory of it. But I, I think it is a great gift for grandma, for, for mom. Yeah. For, any, yeah. for anyone in your life. Uh, it's available on Amazon. It's available at the University of Kentucky Press website. Go to your independent bookstore and ask for it. You know what? Yeah. Because when you ask for it, then that opens doors and it um, you get that kind of service from an independent. Although I think at Barnes and Noble, even in places like that, they are willing to accept those. Yeah. So, you know, you're you are doing your best if you're going to go to a brick and mortar store to keep that tradition alive. And uh, make sure that there's always a bookstore available in your town. So that's important. So, Mallory Lewis, how do we learn more about you and where you're going to be and all of that? My, my website is MalloryLewisAndLambChop.com. My uh, Facebook is an open page, Mallory Lewis. You can tell it's me because there's a picture of me with my puppet. But mostly TikTok, at your fave lamb chop. Please like and follow. I, I I love TikTok and I can often waste an entire Saturday. <laughs> well, we are we are certainly learning that life is short. And um, speaking of that, uh, I did ask you and uh, as we were working on this outline and everything, do do you have the rights to the song that does not end? Can we sing that? Well, because I kind of have to have the permission. Is, this is the song that does doesn't end. end. Yes, it goes on and on, my friend. Some people started singing it, not knowing what it was. And they'll continue singing it or other just because this is not. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to close out this conversation. I want to thank Catherine Yang, who is our sound, I'll just call her a sound genius. Thank you, Mallory, for your time. Thank you. Thank- Thank you for writing the book, for having that come to moment with Nat (laughs) that said, why didn't we do this? And I hope that you only continue to get the love that uh, is out there both for your mom and for your sister, that you are carrying that message to the next generation. Thank you so much. Remember to visit the University of Kentucky Press website to pick up your copy of Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop, the team that changed children's television, or ask for it from your local independent bookstore. Many thanks to Jazzer and his musical ditty, Take Me Higher, which can be found at freemusicarchive.com. We do love our theme music. Clips heard in this episode are from TMJ4 News of Milwaukee's The Morning Blend show, which was posted to their YouTube account in 2017. Somewhere along the line, YouTuber Ron Spears uploaded video from one of Sherry Lewis's live performances. Look on YouTube for Sherry Lewis's Curse Along with Lamb Chop to catch more of the act. And lastly, there was a clip from a 1988 episode of Lamb Chop's Play Along Sing Along. To get the lowdown on all things Advanced TV history, sign up for our e-newsletter. It contains information usually not otherwise posted to social media. Go to tvherstory.com or cynthiabemisabrams.com. Like this podcast? It contains no advertising. Your information will not be sold or retained by any other entity than yours truly. Listeners, in this rapidly changing world, it's been quite soothing to think about Sherry Lewis, Lamb Chop, Crazy Horse, Hush Puppy, and all of the pleasure she produced for generations of children. Furthermore, it's been my pleasure to produce this chat with Mallory Lewis. Sherry's incredible spirit and good work is why I podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. As it goes on and on, my friend, some people started singing it, not knowing what it was. 
And don't continue singing it or other just because this is not... <laughs>